You're black. Whether you are super light, light bright, butter almond, pecan, pistachio, fudge, chocolate. Everybody's black in America. There might be certain privileges for the light skin. There might be certain disadvantages for the dark skin. But legally, there is only one category for African people in the United States. However, in the Caribbean islands, they had a very sophisticated, racialized color hierarchy that still exists to this day. Let me repeat that. In the Caribbean islands, they have a very sophisticated racial color hierarchy based on skin tone that is legally codified that exists to this very day. What am I talking about? In the Caribbean, you have octoroon, you have quadroon, you have mulatto. In the Caribbean islands at that time, being one shade lighter or one shade darker was the difference. In the Caribbean islands at that time, being one shade lighter or one shade darker was the difference between working for the government or picking up the trash. Was the difference between a good job or no job. Was the difference between going to college or never getting an education at all. So in a society where black people were vying for a color supremacy, Garvey's idea could not take root because Garvey wanted unity for the race. Where at that time in the Caribbean, the black bourgeoisie could care less about unity for the race. They wanted the crumbs from the slave master's table. So Garvey begins communicating with Booker T. Washington. Garvey begins communicating with Booker T. Washington. He wants to open up a Tuskegee type of an institute in Jamaica. Garvey wants to open up a Tuskegee type of an institution in Jamaica. So on October the 3rd of 1915, on October the 3rd of 1915, on October the 3rd of 1915, Booker T. Washington invites His Excellency, the Most Honorable Marcus Garvey, to America to visit Tuskegee Institute on October the 3rd of 1915. Garvey packs up. He sets sail. He leaves Jamaica on March the 6th, 1916. When Garvey finally gets to America in March of 1916, Booker T. Washington had already died. Booker T. had died before Garvey could meet him. Garvey goes to Tuskegee anyway, and he meets with Booker T.'s second in command, who is now first in command. He goes to Tuskegee anyway and meets with Garvey's, excuse me, Booker T's second in command, who was now first, and that man's name was R.R. R. Moulton. R.R. R. Moulton, the new principal of the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial School. Marcus Garvey doesn't have a good impression of R.R. R. Moulton. Prophetically so, we find out later that R.R. R. Moulton, the man who replaces Booker T. Washington, was an undercover army agent. R.R. R. Moulton, the man that replaces Booker T. Washington as the head of Tuskegee, was an undercover army agent undercover army agent whose job was to spy on Booker T. Washington because although you've been taught that Booker T. was an accommodationist, he was not. Booker T. Washington was a pan-Africanist who was using Tuskegee Institute as a hideout spot for black radicals. 
Booker T. Washington was using Tuskegee Institute as a hideout spot for black radicals. Yes, he told the white man what he wanted to hear, but that was a distraction so that Booker T. would not draw suspicion to Tuskegee because any black radical in America who needed a place to hide out and get some food and some clean clothes and a place to live could go to Tuskegee Institute. This is the same Booker T. Washington who secretly financed civil rights cases for black America out of his own pocket. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. This is the same Booker T. Washington who personally financed civil rights cases out of his own pocket in order to help push black America forward. There's a book y'all need to read. This is a book y'all need to read. This is a book y'all need to read about him. It's called Booker T. Washington in Africa, The Making of a Pan-Africanist. You need to read this book. The author is a strong black sister out of New York City who published this book a few years ago, I consider this book to be one of the greatest books of the past 50 years. This black woman who's still alive right now, Sister Tyreen Wright, God bless Sister Tyreen Wright for writing this book. Booker T. Washington in Africa, The Making of a Pan-Africanist. You need to go online and order this book right now. Anybody who don't think Booker T. Washington was a Pan-Africanist, you better go online and order this book right now. Booker T. Washington and Africa, The Making of a Pan-Africanist by Tyreen Wright. Sister, you have written one of the most important books for Pan-Africanists in the last 50 years. Let me ask you guys a question. How many of you guys knew that Booker T. Washington was a good friend of this man? How many of y'all knew that Booker T. Washington was good friends with Henry Sylvester Williams, who convened the first Pan-African Conference in 1900? Who knew that? Who knew that? Henry Sylvester Williams, the Trinidadian lawyer who hosted the very first Pan-African Conference, was friends with Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was supposed to speak at the first Pan-African Conference ever in 1900, but he wasn't able to make it. However, Booker T. Washington still advertised and promoted the first Pan-African Conference in England in 1900. That man was a Pan-Africanist. That man was a Pan-Africanist. Did y'all know? That before Marcus Garvey and before W.E.B. Du Bois, did y'all know? Before Marcus Garvey and before W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington hosted at Tuskegee the International Conference of the Negro. I'm going to say it again. At Tuskegee Institute, before Marcus Garvey, before W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington hosted the first international conference of the Negro at Tuskegee, where he brought Africans from Africa. He brought Africans from Africa to Tuskegee and taught them how to build institutions back home in Africa. That's facts. Marcus Garvey wasn't even in the country yet, and Booker T was working with Africa. Marcus Garvey wasn't even in the country yet. Marcus Garvey had not come to America yet, and Booker T Washington was hosting conferences at Tuskegee for Africans. This is why we need the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. This is why we need the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey. This is why we need the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. So let us continue. Garvey meets with R.R. R. Moton at Tuskegee. He doesn't really like the guy. Garvey comes back to New York. Garvey launches a 38 state speaking tour. 38 state speaking tour Marcus Garvey would go on. 
partly to raise money to go back to Jamaica and open up a Tuskegee type of a school in Jamaica. Garvey said, while I'm here, let me do this speaking tour. Raise money for Tuskegee in Jamaica. And when Garvey finished the tour, 38 states, when Garvey finished the tour, he's ready to go home to Jamaica and build Jamaica Tuskegee. And the Pan-Africanist in New York City, the Pan-Africanist in New York City convinced the Honorable Marcus Garvey to stay in America. This is critical. This is critical. The Pan-Africanist in New York City convinced Marcus Garvey to stay in America. They said, Garvey, you can do better here than you can in Jamaica. They said, Garvey, you can do better here than you can in Jamaica. So Marcus Garvey decides to stay in New York City. He begins speaking in Harlem along the infamous 125th Street Soapbox Orator platform. That 40 years later, a child of Garveyism, Malcolm X. 40 years later, a child of Garveyism, Malcolm X. 40 years later, a child of Garveyism, Malcolm X, would also be out there speaking on 125th Street, but Garvey was out there first. And when Garvey got on the speaker's platform, when Marcus Garvey would get up on the soapbox and start speaking and say, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. He electrified black America in a way no leader had done since Frederick Douglass. When Garvey first started the UNIA division of the New York City Division of the UNIA, opportunists came into the movement and tried to destroy it. That's right. The haters came in. The haters came in. The haters came in. And at the early beginning of the organization, they sabotaged the UNIA the first time. They sabotaged it a second time. They sabotaged the New York division of the Garvey movement a third time. But Garvey did not quit. Garvey kept on starting over and starting over and starting over until finally they were able to build the nucleus of the New York UNIA without no haters and opportunists around. You can't build serious black organizations with haters and opportunists. You can't build serious black organizations with haters and opportunists. Had Garvey quit, you would have never got that red, black, and green flag. Had Garvey quit, Pan-Africanism would have never become what it was. Had Garvey gave up, he would have never accomplished the things that he did, psychologically transforming the consciousness of an entire race of people. See, there's something you need to know about Garvey. There's something you need to know about Garvey right now. And this is why you cannot compare him to any other leader after him. Marcus Garvey is the only leader we had since slavery in the world, in the world, who is a leader of African people in the world, Marcus Garvey was not just the leader of something in America. Marcus Garvey was leader of Africans in the world. Everywhere you looked, he built a chapter of the Garvey movement. Everywhere you looked, there was Garveyites. Garveyites in the Caribbean, Garveyites in Central and South America, Garveyites in Europe, Garveyites in Asia, Garveyites in Australia, Garveyites everywhere you look. Marcus Garvey is the only leader we can say who was leader of the African race, not leader of the American Africans, not leader of the Jamaican Africans, not leader of the Caribbean Africans. Marcus Garvey was leader of the African race. You don't believe me? Let me give you some information on the Marcus Garvey divisions. And 
Let me give you some information on the Marcus Garvey divisions. Let me give you some information on the Marcus Garvey divisions. This is coming out of a book called Garvey's Children. This is coming out of a book called Garvey's Children by Tony Sewell. You might want to order it. The Legacy of Marcus Garvey. Garvey's Children by Tony Sewell. You might want to read this. Because in this book, you learn about all the people who took from Garvey but didn't give him credit. In this book, you learn about all the people who copied Marcus Garvey and did not give him credit. But let me read some of the chapters. Listen. In the state of Louisiana, there were 74 branches of the Garvey movement. Did y'all hear what I just said? Did y'all hear what I just said? Did y'all hear what I just said? In the state of Louisiana, there were 74 branches of the Garvey movement. In the state of Virginia, 48 branches of the Garvey movement. In the state of North Carolina, 47 branches of the Garvey movement. Pennsylvania, 45 branches of the Garvey movement. West Virginia, 44 branches. Mississippi, 44 branches. Ohio, 39 branches. Arkansas, 38 branches. New Jersey, 31 branches. Florida, 28 branches. Oklahoma, 28 branches of the Garvey movement in Oklahoma alone. Don't you ever compare Garvey to nobody who came after him. None of them did what he did or even came close. None of them did what he did or even came close. Oklahoma, 28 divisions of the Garvey movement, 28. Let me tell you a little secret. Let me tell you a little secret. Let me tell you a little secret. I'm not stealing anything from Tyreek. Tyreek can't tie my intellectual shoes. He can't tie, there's not a person in the conscious community who can tie my intellectual shoes. Let me get back on topic. And I'm going to send you to the block party the next comment you make. Bring me some seafood salad. Let me stay focused. Don't ever compare a king to a coon. Don't ever compare a king to a coon. Let us stay focused. This is what I want you to know about Oklahoma. This is what I want you to know about Oklahoma. This is what I want you to know about Oklahoma. Remember the Tulsa race war? What year was the Tulsa race war? What year was the Tulsa race war? 1921. When was the Rosewood, Florida race war? 1923. The Tulsa race war was 1921. Rosewood was 1923. What was going on in America in 1921? In 1923, Marcus Garvey was going on. There were Garveyites involved in the Tulsa race war. There were Garveyites involved in the Rosewood race war. That's right, brothers and sisters. There was Garveyites involved standing up, defending the black community in Tulsa. There were Garveyites involved standing up, defending the black community in Rosewood. If you don't believe me, go do your research. Garvey influenced all of that and so much more. Garvey influenced all of that and so much more. Georgia, 26 divisions of the Garvey movement. Illinois, 23 divisions of the Garvey movement. South Carolina, 24 divisions of the Garvey movement. Missouri, 21 divisions of the Garvey movement. California, 16 divisions of the Garvey movement. Guess what else, California? 
Guess what else, California? Guess what else, California? The first black woman to be nominated by a major party for its vice presidential nomination. Her name was Charletta Bass, and she was a Garveyite out of California. Do your research, black feminist. Charletta Bass, the first black woman to receive a major nomination from a party to be vice president in America out of California, was a member of the Garvey movement. Y'all can't deal with me tonight. Y'all can't deal with me tonight. Y'all can't deal with this truth tonight. Y'all not ready for this? Y'all not ready for this? Let's keep on going. Missouri, 21 divisions. California, 16 divisions. New York, 16 divisions. Michigan, 14 divisions. And we know about Michigan, right? Because I believe Malcolm X's father, Earl Little. Malcolm X's father, Earl Little, and Malcolm X's mother, Louise Little. Rest in paradise to all of them. Malcolm X's father, Earl Little and Malcolm X's mother, Louise Little, were officers of the Garvey movement. And they were officers in either Lansing, was it uh, Omaha, Nebraska? I think it was in Michigan. When Malcolm's family moved to Michigan, I believe that's when his father became leader of a UNIA division, Earl Little. He could have been leader in Omaha, Nebraska, but I think he didn't become leader until they moved to Michigan. I got to double check that. But what we do know is that Malcolm X's mother and father were officers in Garvey's organization. In fact, when Marcus Garvey was arrested, when Marcus Garvey was arrested, Malcolm X's father wrote to the president of the United States. Y'all not ready. Y'all not ready for this. Y'all not ready for this. You don't want to go there with me on Garveyism because I will expose you. You don't want to go there with me on Garveyism. Malcolm X's father, Earl Little, president of a UNIA division, wrote to the president of the United States demanding that Marcus Garvey be released from prison. That's what Malcolm X's father did. Do your research. Do your research. Do your research. Do your research, brothers and sisters. Malcolm X's mother used to write for Marcus Garvey's newspaper, The Negro World. Louise Little was one of the leading female contributors. Malcolm's mother was a leading contributor to The Negro World newspaper. Go do your research. I got a little treat for you. I got a little treat for you. Let's see what Malcolm X had to say about his parents in the Garvey movement. I got a little treat for you. Let me find where Malcolm said it. Let me tell you what El Hodge Malik El Shabazz himself said about his parents in the Garvey movement. Where is it at? Where is, where is it at? Where you at, Brother Malcolm? Long live El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Let me find Malcolm. Tell you what Malcolm said. Where you at, Malcolm? Give me one second, brothers and sisters. I'm looking for Malcolm. They got everybody in this book. Dr. King is in this book. Y'all do know that after Malcolm was murdered, after Malcolm X was murdered, after the son of Garveyites was murdered, Dr. King went to Jamaica and visited the grave of Marcus Garvey. After Malcolm was murdered, Dr. King came to Jamaica and visited Garvey's grave. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Jamaica, visited Garvey's grave. And once Dr. King got back to America, 
after visiting Garvey's grave in 1965, right after Malcolm was murdered, Dr. King comes back to America after visiting Garvey, his grave, and Dr. King started sounding like Marcus Garvey. Dr. King started sounding like Marcus Garvey. Dr. King started sounding like Marcus Garvey. You don't believe me? Listen to Dr. King from 65 to 68. Listen to Dr. King from 65 to 68 and tell me he was in touch with the spirit of Garveyism. Listen to Dr. King from 65 to 68 and tell me he don't sound like the most honorable Marcus Garvey. Where you at, Malcolm? Hold on. I got a quote in here from Malcolm about his parents growing up in the Garvey movement. Where you at, Malcolm? I want to quote Malcolm L. Hodge. Where you at, Malcolm? Here we go. Y'all ready? Let me quote. Black Muslim activist Malcolm X was another person whose early life was connected to the rise of Garveyism in America. He explained in his autobiography how as a child, his father was, a, it was in perpetual fear for his family because he was a member of Marcus Garvey's movement. He recalls a particular incident where Malcolm X says, quote, Malcolm X says, quote, when my mother was pregnant with me, she told me later a party of hooded Ku Klux Klan riders galloped up to our home, brandishing shotguns and rifles. They shouted for my father to come out. The Klansmen shouted threats and warnings at her that we had better get out of town because the good Christian white people were not going to stand for my father spreading trouble among the good Negroes of Omaha. So they were still in Omaha, brothers and sisters. They were still in Omaha. Malcolm's parents were leaders of the Garvey movement in Omaha, Nebraska. Listen to this. Malcolm said, that the good Christian white people were not going to stand for my father spreading trouble among the good Negroes of Omaha with the back to Africa preachings of Marcus Garvey. Malcolm X describes his father, the Reverend Earl Little as quote, they're quoting Malcolm, listen to this, a dedicated organizer for Marcus Garvey's UNIA. With the help of such disciples as my father, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, from his headquarters in New York City's Harlem, was raising the banner of black race purity and exhorting the Negro masses to return to their ancestral home, a cause for which had made Garvey the most controversial black man on earth. Did y'all hear that? Malcolm X said, the most honorable Marcus Garvey was the most controversial black man on earth. Marcus, excuse me, Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz said that Marcus Garvey was the most controversial black man on earth. The book goes on. Most of Malcolm's family had lost their lives through lynching, including six uncles. How many of y'all knew that six of Malcolm X's uncles were lynched? How many of y'all knew that six of Malcolm X's uncles were lynched? His father was killed doing work for the Honorable Marcus Scarvey. Malcolm X's father was killed for the work he was doing on behalf of African people for the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Listen to this. The death of Malcolm's uncles had been the primary impetus 
to his father being willing to risk his own life to spread the Garvey message. Malcolm describes a typical UNIA